Thank you all, and, and good morning. And uh, it's a delight to be here. Um, and now between Milton and me uh, and Michael Fields, who's a NPR alum, we've got you surrounded <laughs> between the Washington Post and NPR. So I'm delighted to be here. Thank you so much for coming out early on a, on an early fall day. I, uh, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about where we are at uh, NPR and where public radio and public television, the challenges we face, and to also s ask you to <clears throat> think with me about the power of the station in the community, because that's what you all have supported. From us at NPR, I want to first of all say to you all, both staff of the station <clears throat> on the radio and the television side, and increasingly on the digital side, and to the great supporters of WABE in all its past and in the great challenges ahead of us, I want to thank you on behalf of, of NPR. You know, we don't have, NPR is not really a network. We're, we're a membership organization. We have about 300 member stations. They range in size and in shape and in <coughs> reach from the very smallest on, on uh, Native American reservations in the Southwest all the way through to New York City where they have a million listeners a week um, uh, to, to one of their services on, on WNYC. So it's a very complicated, fascinating remarkable community, and it's all about volunteerism, about community support, and about a kind of evocation of the actual reality of the civil society in this country. I can always get a, li li a laugh from anybody by saying, you know, I'm delighted to be here. I'm from Washington. I've come to help you, you know. <laughs> uh, at the Washington Post for many years, one of my pals, uh, now unfortunately no longer with us, was Art Buchwald. And he used to write a column every year, uh, which he would start it out saying, returning to Washington from the United States of America, comma. <laughs> but one of the great realities that I've been able to, to actually to see and to, to, to touch is because I've traveled widely for the past decade to all, to as many stations as asked me to come. I see the American reality in a series of communities. If you stand away from it, it's a kind of enormous, you know, national mosaic. It has this shape that most of us know. We can sort of, without even looking at a map, we can see it, see the outlines of it. We also know our own community. We know its outlines. What's often harder to think about is the communities next door, north or south, wherever they might be. And to think about the fact that we're, while we're communities together, we're also going to be contiguous, very similar, but with extraordinary differences. So the American communities that make up this nation are both very similar and also have their own challenges, their own perspectives, their own realities, their own voices, and their own continuities. Across America, in a history of constant consolidation on the, on the commercial side, it's the public radio and television stations that stand today as a most authentic, actual presentation of the community's views, its perspectives, and where it's going, its failures as well as its great successes, and its spiritual values brought to it by the extraordinary medium of radio, which I find, you know, I spent 25 years at the Washington Post. I'm basically a, I'm a recovering hack journalist, and I'll never probably recover from it. But what I know about radio after a decade here with, with you all and with all the other great stations and with NPR, first of all, and this is no rap against the uh, Journal Constitution, I know Hank Klebanoff, the, the editor, I've known him for years. I knew him in Moscow many years ago, so we go back a long ways. You can go to any newspaper in this country where they've, you know, where they're deep in the community, they know what they're doing very well. You walk in there, and the city room generally is pretty contained, pretty quiet. You go to the public radio and television station, and they're on fire. You can ask them, let's see, by chance, just to test it out, do you have Klemperer's, Beethoven's, set, and they, before you can even get it out of your mouth, they know exactly where it is on the, in the CD library, and they can actually tell you where it is in the vinyl. Am I wrong? Uh-uh. 
And the other part of it is, is that the stations also, because of the nature of radio and the way it works in people's minds and the way public radio has done it from the beginning, the way you all have supported it and nurtured it, you've made a place for community because the radio comes to you not to try to transact anything with you, but to invite you into a consideration, whether, whether, it, be, whether it be news or commentary or call-in show or music. I think of music as something essential to us all because it helps us reset the compass of our lives every day by bringing to us encounter that isn't described in terms of events <coughs> or facts or histories of any sort, but it's an immediate continuum of spiritual expression of the human experience through composers, through, through the musicians and the performers, and also through the presentation of it by the stations. So what you're doing in this community and how you've helped it grow and serve the needs of the community is just extraordinary. And one of the powers of public radio in my decade, when I came to NPR, the national audience to our, <coughs> to our programming was about 13 million listeners a week. That's one person listening just once. According to Arbitron, and Arbitron is about to change the way in which they measure this, and you're, you're on the front lines of that change with the so-called people meters coming in. What a world we live in. I've got a thing on my belt that can read what you're listening to, you know, knows the frequency and how long you've been listening to it. It's a little bit eerie. But it's coming. And we, we will make the changes necessary to understand how this new dynamic works. But what I know is, is that the radio, because you can't see the thing, if it's done right, as you all and as we all have done, people start coming to it because it's not an intruder. It's actually a friend. And it, because it's radio, you can be doing anything else in your life, as we know. You can be jogging, driving, stuck in – no, that never happens here. <laughs> any of those things that are commonplace in your life and the radio is there with you. And out of the blue, you're sitting in traffic or you're, you're on the exercise bike or whatever it is you might be doing. And here comes a story from Harare, Zimbabwe. Here comes a voice out of this ether to connect you in a different way to what's happening in a place that's about 7,500 miles from here, which you might not have been thinking about when you started your day. But suddenly you find yourself quite intrigued with what, what you're hearing because there's a human narrative with an arc of the narrative which has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And every one of us from that size all the way up has been hearing narrative since we first could understand language. So the radio done the way WABE does it and done in the partnership that we have with, uh, with you all and that other great producers have, uh, American Public Media, Public Radio International, other stations as well that are producing and originating their own programming. We're able to touch people in a unique way and the power of it then becomes a power of companionship <clears throat> and of context because what's coming out of Harare is not just a flash headline, something terrible happened today, the what, but over and over again, from wherever it might be, whether it's from Denver, where I was a couple of weeks ago, I just happened to drop in. <laughs> we, I, I, you know, we, we, did, we drew straws, uh, my CO and I, and, and I don't know whether I got the long one or the short one, but he wound up in Minneapolis. <laughs> but here it comes, and suddenly you find yourself thinking about and just listening to this story from a, a quite a distance away or from actually around the corner. And it comes to you in a way that kind of helps you think. You say, gee, I never thought about that before. So what has happened to public radio is that it, it has become a kind of medium where it becomes – it helps people nurture habits of mind. There's nobody in this room who doesn't think of himself or herself as essentially a citizen of the world. You know, we can be in Atlanta, we can be in Denver, we can be in New York, we could be in Washington, we can be in all these different places. We can be in Dubuque, Iowa. We still, our minds are still not confined to that locality and yet we depend on the locality because the locality gives us our own authenticity. And that authenticity has not just been protected in public radio and public television, it's been strengthened because of your support. And 
millions of Americans across the country who support their public radio and television stations in the same way. So the context of where we are, I think, is a service to the nation which continues to be nurtured by you all and also continues to grow. When I came uh, at the end of 98, we had about 13 million listeners, as I said. It's now approaching 27 million. That's at a time when all the media in this country, all the so-called mainstream media, are facing tremendous fracturing of their readerships, their viewerships, and their listenerships. Yet public radio continues to, uh, to aggregate a larger audience because of the great support that you all are giving the station. Um, to speak more specifically, because of the support that's happened and the growth of the, of the audience, we've been able to, to increase our service back. So when I came to NPR, we had about eight foreign bureaus, and now we've got 18. Uh, we're in so many tough places. Not only have we been in Baghdad for many years, but we've also, we're in Kabul with a, with a full-time bureau there, a full-time uh, uh, resident correspondent. Uh, Kabul is now much more dangerous than Baghdad, and so we're having to look at that in terms of the security issues for this one person, one Westerner in a city where there are not so many Westerners who aren't, you know, armed and dangerous, um, doing the work of civilians trying to find out what's happening in this very complicated country at a very difficult time. We believe powerfully in contextual journalism that tells us not just the what of it, but also what is the context around it so we can try to understand the why. We also know that radio journalism, it's a mosaic. It's six-minute piece or a seven-minute piece or four-and-a-half-minute piece that might reference something else. So no piece by itself, no segment, no matter how well it's produced, is going to tell the whole story. But if we're there putting the context, coming back and doing it again and doing it again and putting it over here and keeping the flow of this kind of quality journalism, quality factual reporting in front of us, it's going to help the society, help us do what we need to do in acts of citizenship. Now, what is that? It's not about U.S. citizenship. I happen to have been born in Canada. I could, I've got dual citizenship. It's the acts of citizenship that have to do with commitment to the society to understand what's happening. And by understanding that, to help us function better as citizens. I spent a lot of time in the then Soviet Union and in many years thereafter when I was at Radio for Europe, traveling widely across, across the whole of Eurasia, looking at uh, the societies that were trying to, in effect, to resurrect themselves after the wreckage of, the, of, the, of, the, uh, of this very totalitarian, repressive empire. I just came in last night. Uh, uh, thank you very much. You, you met me at the plane with a, with a, with a very long limo. <laughs> And uh, the, the driver said, um, hello, how are you? And I said, um, Central Europe? He said, Bulgaria. <laughs> there are about 4,000 Bulgarians here in Atlanta, and this guy's one of them. And when he was a kid and into his middle life, he used to listen to the Bulgarian service of Radio for Europe. So it was like old home week. His, his, his daughter, you'll be pleased to know, has just graduated from, you know, from the uh, University of Georgia Law School. So this, is like, this guy's been here for 10 years. So there's another part of who we are that I want to tell you means so much to what we are and what we can always become. So this man is an immigrant. He lived in Plovdiv, which is the second largest city in, in Bulgaria. I had the great pleasure of being in Sofia, which is their capital, but I never made it to Plovdiv. But we traded stories about blood deep anyway. Um, he's here with his wife, and he has family back there. He's an American citizen. He got, a, he got, a, 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 he got it in the, in the uh, green card lottery. He, 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 he got lucky 10 years ago, and that's how they got here. He, doesn't, he spoke no English when he came. He was an actor, he told us, uh, told me on the, on the stage in, in Sofia and in Bulgarian theater, which I'm not sure how big of a theater that is, but it's, a, it's their national theater. So he's had no interest in learning English. He now speaks very good English. Accented. His wife, he said, her entire life had dreamed of living in America. And his daughter, at age eight, said, 
Daddy, somehow I know I'm going to be a lawyer in America. So here we are. Every one of us, whether we came in force or in freedom, every one of us is, a, is an immigrant. Every one of us has running in our heads at any time of the day or night some part of the story about where they came from, whoever the they were, and we don't even know them sometimes. There are no photographs, there are no, there are no records at all, or there's some and they're fractional, and they're mythical people, and they're mythical stories that probably are based in truth. Yet here we are as Americans sitting together today, s coming together to think about the authenticity of this community and what this station has done in reaching back out to the world beyond to bring news of what's happening out there so that we can understand it better. And to me, it's a kind of redeeming reality of the American, of the American reality because we're not just here, we're not just safe behind our borders. I'm talking about this in the context of what's coming in a couple of days, another anniversary of 9-11. What did 9-11 do for us? It was like a terrible wake-up call that we are part of the world we're part of a world that's going to demand things of us. It's going to demand recognition. If you come right down to it, whatever those attacks were, they were a demand for recognition that there is something else out there that we need to understand better, and we're ultimately going to have to deal with it one way or another, not only by force, but by something else as well. For us as this society, we face these kinds of issues on small scale and on medium scale, seldom on the scale of 9-11, of but there it is in front of us. So here I am driving through the night with this guy. He said, now, he said, at last, because he only got his citizenship in the last few years, his English is good enough. He said, now I have enough English, I can actually understand what they're all talking about. So he's going to go out on November, November 4th, and he's going to vote. He's going to vote, and he's now listening to guess what? W-A-B-E. He said, ah, 90.1, I said. <laughs> so there's, a, there's something touching about this that brings us back to what it is we're all doing together. What we are doing now and what you've been doing for 60 years, that's when the license came, <clears throat> and W-A-B-E became a member, an NPR member station, in May of 1971. That's not an accident <clears throat> because it was in the spring of 1971 that all things considered first went on the air. Distributed by phone lines to about 90 stations across the country. I have, we have at NPR in our archives, I've seen it, a, a map of the United States with the phone lines drawn in. <laughs> in a, and there are places in where the phone, yeah, they're drawn in, in different crayon. And there, there are places like when the phone line goes north from, uh, it goes up through uh, from N New York City, it goes up the Connecticut River Valley, uh, and I don't know if you know that part of the world, but it goes up through uh, uh, Hartford, and then it kind of goes up through Springfield. It gets to the M Massachusetts Vermont border, and it's, dri and it's from then on, it's in very thin pencil. Because <laughs> nobody knew what happened after it got, <laughs> got to the Massachusetts Vermont border. My point here is, is that you have created something from those drawings to today that has been part of the American, the fabric of our society, and increasingly is serving this country in a way that no other of our media are serving it. And partly that's because of the nature of radio, because it doesn't get in the way. You don't have to stop and look at a widescreen television and, first of all, figure out how to make the darn thing get to HD. <laughs> and you don't have to read the paper. And we don't have time in the same way we did Year, as we did 10 years ago or 15 years ago, our lives are full now. And they're full of lots of different things. And so radio becomes an amazing medium. And riding right along with it is public television, which has the same values, the same presentations, and the same instincts to serve the community and also help create a national reality that is authentic, that is real in the community, and that is not about nostalgia and thinking about the past, but is actually looking at the past as it can help us understand our own present and future better. So here we are at NPR. This audience has grown. We have many more foreign bureaus. We're doing much better and much deeper programming and reporting from around the country. 
I'm going in a week and a half out to California. We have opened, we opened there five years ago a very large, what is now a very large production center in Culver City, California. If any of you get out that way, between visiting Disneyland and, and whatever else might take you out there or visiting relatives, you should give me a call or write me at kclose dot n at npr dot org or just call and you can find our find our number it's very easy two oh two five one three two thousand and tell me you're coming out there and we'd love to show you NPR NPR West in Culver City. It's right near it, it's it's about twenty minutes from, from uh Santa Monica for example. It's about twenty minutes from LAX if you're out there. I want to issue the same invitation if you're coming north to Washington, D.C., and you get a visa that lets you go out of the country and come and land in Washington, <laughs> we'd love to have you come and visit us. Uh, we do regular public tours of NPR. We're like a different edition of this. We don't have big television studios, but we've got a lot of radio people there. Um, and I, somebody came in a couple, uh, just a week ago, and I said, this is uh, Linda Wertheimer. And he, that's Linda Wertheimer? I said, yes, you know, we don't look like you imagined <laughs> because it's radio. So going forward, let me just put another, uh, another uh, piece on the ground that we need to deal with, which is di the digital reality. I know you all have become, with this great leadership, you're very, very far down that road. But where is the road leading? We actually don't know. The road is experimental. It's a revolutionary time in the way people are using media in this country. I was in New York recently, at a, went to a, a foundation, which is very, foundations have been very supportive of us through the years. So I'm there, you know, doing the relationship thing. I walked in into the uh, uh, into reception area, two young women there. Oh, you're from NPR. You know, I'm looking at these kids. I'm the age of their grandparents. So it doesn't mean a, heck, a great deal, but they say, oh, you're from NPR. I said, yeah, I am. Um, are you listeners? Yes. One of them says, I can't live without this American life. And the other one says, I've got to listen to Morning Edition every day. And I said, terrific. And you don't have radios, do you? Of course not. <laughs> one hears This American Life on her iPod, and the other one listens online. On the, on the laptop at home, and if, this, if, if, she, if she can't get to it during the day, she picks it off that night and streams it onto, her, onto her, her laptop at night, just so she can pick up where she was. There are probably 200 million nobody even knows anymore. iPods have been sold in the last two and a half or three years. That's changing the way the next generation and the way this generation and you all are starting to use media in a new way. We have to be there. We have to take the same great values of community, of authenticity, of community engagement and support. As Robert Siegel has said, this thing is counterintuitive. If you could get the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or the, or the Journal of Constitution on your doorstep every day for free, why would you pay for it? But those values of community, in which people voluntarily commit to nurture and strengthen and help the community through the institution of public radio and public television, deal with its own issues better and understand the world better. You do that, that has to be transferred to these things in some way that makes sense, in some way that keeps the identities together, and in some way that will not just demand or seek, but inspire people to figure out how do I support this thing, which I'm now listening to along with 40,000 other providers. So that's the issue in front of us all. For you all and for us, we're going to continue experimenting down this path going forward. There we go. <laughs> and, um, and we're going to keep finding the future out of not just the technology, but the contact and the engagement with people. And for us at NPR, it is a great challenge. We see it as, as somewhat uncertain, but we're not – one of the things about journalism, like all the things that you all have done, is that journalism is whatever else it is, with all its flaws and its, <clears throat> its, uh, its sort of imprecisions, it actually is actually rather persistent. It comes back to the story and comes back to the story and comes back to the story and keeps trying to go after it again. So we're persistent, and you all are persistent. 
we're being nurtured by what comes back to us, which is greater service to the community and a sense of, of not just commitment, but a sense of citizenship that has helped us do our work better. As we are a nonprofit and as we depend upon and look to you for the voluntary support you give us, that again strengthens the fabric of the civil society and becomes a representative reality of it. So I want to thank you all, first of all, for gathering today. Uh, do, we have, do we have time for questions? I'd love to take questions, but finally I want to say, in the end, and I've said this to many, many audiences because it's absolutely essentially true, Jefferson, before he wrote the Declaration of Independence and whatever his flaws were, we know, we know there were plenty. He and the other founding fathers used to write back and forth many essays about what it was they were trying to create. And one of them he wrote about what it was that had to do with the press as it was known then. And what he said was, and this is 21st century soundbite version of it, he said that people can't be both ignorant and free. So in the end, as activated citizens of a society that is self-governing, we've got to have information. We've got to have credible, reliable, authentic information that isn't fakery, that isn't simply somebody's opinion or somebody's can't or somebody's diatribe or somebody's dialogue of the deaf. It's got to be information that will help us understand our world better so we can function in this self-governing society and step up to the responsibilities that it requires of us, which is ultimately to make informed decisions about our leaderships, whatever they are, at the civic level, at the city level, at the county level, and on up. Ultimately, we have our own fate in our own hands. We really do. And with all the difficulties we have facing us and all the challenges facing this great country, and this great community, ultimately, what you all are supporting, I believe, is helping us do all the work of citizenship better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. The speed of the collapse 15 years ago, st I think, stunned the world. It just went like that. The, uh, the helter-skelter period right after did nothing to, n to nurture people's faith in democracy because it went through tremendous economic upheavals and, and dislocations. And now they have running it um, with Putin we can leave the other guy aside for just a minute. Uh, the, uh, Putin is a statist. That's what it's all about. He comes from a long history, the KGB, the, uh, the uh, NKVD, and all the way back to the, to the Tsarist era, um, the Czechists and the Okhrana and so forth, right back deep into history. These, uh, these activities, these structures inside the Russian reality are interested only in the survival of the state. That's the deal. And they're almost indifferent to actually who runs it as such, so long as they can control it. And that's what we're looking at. Um, I think that the, the adventure in the Caucasus <clears throat> is clearly a kind of strategic overstretch on the part of this country with a very unreliable and bizarre democratic leader in, in this little uh, country of Georgia. I've been in Gori, Gori, which has uh, became one of the linchpins of the the edge of the, of the Russian uh, incursion. It's the birthplace of Stalin. I've been to his birthplace. Um, Stalin actually was a Georgian. He wasn't a Russian. Uh, and probably single-handedly probably caused the loss of more Russian lives than probably any single human being in the history of, of Russia. So maybe there's payback. I don't know. <laughs> but the issue is there's not a great deal we can do about Georgia where it is many thousands of miles, hard to reach, and so forth. And everything we're going to be doing there in terms of trying to rebuild, whatever that means, a 
fractured and non-governing, non-government situation uh, where government doesn't really function but functions on the uh, impulses of a very erratic leadership. I think it's very hard for us. Um, and I think the real reason that the Russians did what they did is because north of there is Ukraine, which is a big breadbasket country with 55 million people in it. There are only about 5 million people in Georgia. It's right on the Russian border. Uh, it's been dominated by Russia its entire history. Uh, and it wants to be a member of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. It wants to be a member of the European Union. It wants to be connected to the West. And uh, that, from the Russian point of view, from Moscow's point of view, is a kind of piece of a big encirclement, which they feel very uneasy about. I'm not speaking for them or against them, but the history has been very tough for them over the years, especially the history of the 20th century, where they had two world wars um, and where they lost, nobody really knows, probably 20 plus million people in the in the cauldron of World War II. Uh, without Russia, uh, the, the Russians basically took the brunt of the German of the German fury. Uh, they lost many more lives than than, uh, than we have any conception of. And so they look at encirclement. They look at the at the structure of the state in a rather different way than we look at ours. They don't have oceans and peaceful borders. They've had all kinds of dif difficulties. That doesn't excuse what they've done, and it doesn't excuse the fact that they have essentially a very repressive, a, a kind of civil repressive government. They're not, but, you know, they've slowly but surely they've disciplined all the media. They've intimidated it down. There are about two or three independent media outlets in Moscow, the capital city, and that's about it. Um, and they're, but the way around that, of course, is through the internet, and that speaks to us. There are Russians now on your website. There are Russians now learning about Atlanta through WABE. There are people all around the world looking at the openness of American society and grasping for it and trying to understand better what it is that makes this country tick. What are its principles? What are its goals? What are its realities? What are its, its ethics? And what makes it tick in the way that it does? And how can I think about that? What I know from my days at Radio for Europe, as long as there is a signal up in some language, it doesn't matter. If the signal is there, somebody's going to be listening to it. So the website is the sort of worldwide signal for you all. And that's why the way you are thinking about and exploring the future in the digital age speaks to that reality. And that's how we're going to have effects in a different way in places like Georgia and ultimately across all of Russia. Because people, in the end, no matter what we're, no matter what our privations, we're not indifferent. We're not inert objects. We start to move, and once consciences start to move, things start to happen. Yes, sir. Now there's a lineup. Yeah. I was struck by your, uh, your narrative about this younger, yeah. you know, two million person. I can't see how it helps anywhere else in the world. What kind of impact do you hope to have as a head player? Yeah, yeah, the suits. Uh, It's a it's a real question. Um, you know the the, t the 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 demographic of our of our listenership on the public radio side is about 50. That's that's the median age now. The median age of this nation, popu the national population, is, is is younger than that by a few years. Uh, the issue for us is, is to make your point. The way we see it is how do how do we get to the contextual information that isn't just you know isn't just Twitter. It's, it's something with deeper substance. And the point that we're looking at very, very intently, and I, I think you are as well, it's the interactivity of things that are so important to that generation. And even though you might start at Twitter, ultimately, and I actually find a lot of it rather self-centered and sort of odd to me that there's 
that the sense of privacy is sort of gone from these fr from the generations down there. They want to actually participate in a different way, but you, that's actually a positive force when we look at it. And so what we're doing together is we're going to be exploring interactivity so we can learn at the at this level, at the level that I live at and have lived at all my life, which is contextual, edited, produced, fact-checked journalism, to take the stuff that's out there that the kids are seeing because they're, these things are seeing and, and recording everything. These are the Swiss Army knives of the digital age. You know, they can do any damn thing. And, and they're now into G3, which is going to be even more powerful, and G4 is coming after that. So they're going to be recording the world at the level of millions of things happening all the time. The question for us is how do we have relevance to that and how do we bring it in and give it, a, uh, give it an expression that will play back to them their values and their trading of va values and ideas. We're in, the, we're, in the pro we're in the hunt for that. And we're doing a, a whole bunch of uh, technological changes at NPR to open our content to 15-year-olds. If they want it, they can have it. If they want to mess with it and mash it up, they can have it. That's where we're going because it's going to become real in their lives as something that they can have in their lives and they can trade out with other people. We have to take it, we have to let go of some of our control and let it fly away and let them have it and hold the identity and the power and the, and the, <clears throat> and the, 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 uh, the, the inspiring support that these kinds of, that this kind of content has. If it sounds sort of mythical to you, believe me, it has meant much power on the ground. There are across the country, in Oakland, California, there's something called Youth Radio. If, and you've heard it because we, we run their segments on our, <clears throat> on, on, our, on our shows. In New York, they call it Radio Rookies. Same thing. In Portland, Maine, they've got a statewide kids network that they're building out of these things. And they're starting to trade information back and forth and trade knowledge as a result. And their knowledge base is growing at the level of the 11, 12, 13, 14, 15-year-olds. They're learning this stuff in a completely new way. So it's going to be a more open system, but ultimately, you know, there has to be the facts have got to be right. And they'll get to that, that assumption of what their responsibilities are, that they can't just fly it, kite it off because somebody else out there is going to say it didn't happen that way. That's the first thing that's going to happen. And when you have enough of those encounters, you start to say, I better check with them before I put it out. And so you start to have organically a kind of society that empowers itself to get, its, get it, its way like a surge towards something, like a, like a flow towards shared identities, shared views, shared perspectives, and shared understandings of what actually happened an hour ago or a minute ago or a year ago. And it's a very, very interesting place for us to be. Long answer, but great question. Thank you. Yes. Right. Yes. We're actually in a, <clears throat> in a very, uh, a very uh, determined discussion, and it's not a single-point discussion, but it's across. We're never going to get any more out of the FCC than we've got right now. Uh, but the Congress, we're looking to Congress. We're starting, we we want to start a dialogue with uh, the major appropriators about the future of public broadcasting. <clears throat> we're funded from the, from the Congress at about a minimum of $400 million a year. That goes, most of it goes to public television stations. About 80 million of it goes to public radio stations. NPR share d has none of that directly. Many of the stations turn the federal money around and pay it to us or pay it to American Public Media or to PRI or somebody like that. Uh, we'd like more of that to stay at home. In any event, I I've said to a number of the new found the foundations have new leaderships. We're not a $160 million enterprise at NPR anymore. This is an $800 million public radio network per year. That's the flow through across the country. You've got to think of it in completely different terms. So we need more resources to get to the 
expression of how high quality the digital can be. Uh, digital radio, you can put on one signal, you can put three channels, four channels, and it'll get, it'll actually, as they learn more, it's going to multiply yet, yet more. I will tell you, I have right here, and I haven't had a chance to read it from overnight from our brilliant uh, chief, chief technical guy, Mike Starling, who many of you know in public, in public radio. Um, we have been, I've been deeply interested in using radio in new ways. For example, uh, we, have, we have radio reading services for the blind across the, across the country. We've been looking at radio for the deaf. Now, what would that be? That's text radio. And we've been at the forefront of that. There are about 25 million Americans who are severely hearing impaired or profoundly deaf. They've never had radio in their lives. So now you're on the Gulf Coast, and here comes Hurricanes Rita and Katrina. Just imagine what happened. The first thing that happens when there's any power fluctuation at all is the TV goes off the air because you can't run a TV on a battery. <clears throat> and the TV station goes down because that's a problem too because it takes a lot of power to run those things. So they're sitting at home. They have no idea what's happening and no way to know. So we've been thinking about text radio, and we've been working with a, a number of, of associations of, of, of the hearing impaired to set standards. And you know what? There are some great companies in this country which have spent for years have been looking at uh, voice-to-text for a whole variety of reasons, and they're getting sharper and sharper. And these voice-to-text programs, they might not understand the first five minutes that I, that, I, that I read the script, but the, the computer can start to get voice recognition and they can start to understand my accent and my mispronunciations and start to correct them in the text. That's what's happening. We're at the forefront of that and we're about to make a major proposal to one of these great companies to see if we can't push this out. That's digital. You can get a, we, my view, my vision is a single box that is digital or, or analog radio that has whatever you want on it is in one place. It's got a screen on it, so if you're profoundly deaf or you just don't want to listen anymore, you can read the thing. And it also will do sound and will give it to you in many multi-channel fashions. That's what has to happen. In the, in the radio reading services for the blind, we know that there are many people who are, who are vision impaired, and as the society ages, those issues are going to continue to multiply. Only about a million people, we think, listen to the radio reading services across the country. That's because they have to buy a separate radio set. It has a very poor signal on it. They have to, <clears throat> they have to arbitrate and they can't see anyway. So you put that on the single box and have a box that can talk back to you, either in text or in audio, and say, I want to, uh, you know, I need my radio reading services, and says, okay, I'll get there in you know, three seconds. That's where we're going to. That's serving the nation without regard to whether people have powers of hearing or vision or mobility. And that's the power of HD. We're not there yet. We've probably got another 10 years to go before we get to where you want us to be. But as we move forward, the Congress will come along. <laughs> they might not go there on their own, but we can get them there. Yes, Milton. So StoryCorps, you know, is the invention of this brilliant uh, MacArthur genius grantee named David Isay, whom I think many of you know. I was just with him last week, but uh, we had a wonderful conversation. Um, StoryCorps is two Airstream <coughs> trailers moving around the country from libraries to schools to radio and television stations doing generational conversations um, um, one might say refereed by, but no, uh, facilitated by f professional facilitators, kids who've been trained in getting the generations to speak to each other. And we put on NPR, we use one of these, at least one a week, every week, but they're recording hundreds of these. They are acquiring through this amazing process a history of the generational realities in America and going back in history because the grandchildren and the children 
and the grandnieces and nephews are asking great-grandmother or great-grandpa what happened back then. And it's a phenomenal reality of, of, the Ameri of the tapestry of life in America. The GRIO project is a part of it, and that is capturing African-American oral history in the same way. And it has enormous power and authenticity. Every one of these, of these uh, uh, interviews, and they typically last about 40 minutes, we put four or five or six minutes on the air, and David and his editorial team choose the ones they want us to use. So we don't have any control over that. Uh, they, they make that choice on their own. But we're part of this project. We've been a supporter of it for, for three or four years since it began, as is the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Uh, the GRIO project is doing it with, with African Americans specifically. Every one of these interviews, these dialogues, these discussions, which are fascinating, is being, is being uh, archived in the Library of Congress to expand the oral library of this, of the oral history of this country. So it's a fascinating project. It's incredibly empowering. And David, whom I spent part of an evening with last week, has enormous ideas about how to, how to continue to build this. I think that's going to continue on and be part of our lives for a very, very long time. He has great, great visions about how to do that. Finally, it's the authenticity of you all, of everyone who's here. We have the power to communicate. We have the power to reach out and touch other people. The radio and television station, WABE, it's great license, licensed practitioners who can help us connect to the community. That's what you've given. That's your gift to Atlanta and to the Atlanta community. And the GRIO project and StoryCorps and This I Believe, which you, which you can hear on, also, these are people being asked to give tiny essays about what it is they actually believe in. These realities of America, I think, are so important to who we are, not just for today, but for the future. So I want to say on behalf of all of us, thank you for all that you've done. And I look forward to seeing and hearing and watching more of you as the world continues to open. Thanks so much.